serious. When did y'all stop being innocent and learn how dark the world was? Like, what moment changed how y'all viewed the world? When I was 12, our grandmother sued us. We won the case, but lost everything in the process. My parents weren't able to pay the mortgage and other bills since, you know, they were busy paying legal fees. My grandmother is a large part of why my preteen teenage years were spent in abject poverty. Honestly, I looked at people differently after that. It taught me that despite my parents saying that they could always trust family, that no one was so infallible as to be worthy of complete trust. No one. Secretly watching my mom in the dining room because she was screaming and woke eight-year-old me up as she feebly tried to defend herself from the slashing attacks of my drunken stepfather. Not much robs you of your childhood innocence, quite like watching your mom's blood spatter onto the walls. Not that the walls were covered or anything, but the few spots that were still there the next morning were proof that I hadn't dreamt it. Her injuries weren't really life-threatening, but they certainly revealed a dark truth under the veneer of normalcy. I started paying attention and noticed how frequent the abuse was. She eventually left him, but it left her more psychologically damaged than physically harmed. Growing up was rough after that. It wasn't until that particular incident, though, that I realized how fucked up our situation was. My high school had maybe half a dozen bomb threats one year. Now, as a student, I didn't particularly mind. It got me out of school, and that was great. But we had a big assembly in the gym where the principal told the student body that they were going to find the perpetrators and that they would be permanently expelled from school, charged by the police, etc. They did find the two guys calling in the bomb threats. Their parents were school board members. They did not get expelled. They did not get charged. They each got a six-month suspension with their homework being sent home to them so they could still graduate on time. They were basically rewarded with a vacation because of who their parents were. I didn't need Epstein to learn that money and power can get you out of almost any jam. I learned that shit back in high school. Probably when I was eight, I found out I could upload vids to YouTube and really wanted to belly dance. So I put on a tight-fitting shirt and my favorite shorts and belly danced my heart out. Got a ton of comments of praise, which my innocent mind thought meant I was doing a good job. Someone asked for a private video of the same dance, but without clothes. I regret it, but I did it because I was under the impression it was the more traditional way of doing things. Then he blackmailed me for years into doing other nasty things nude for him, saying he would have my parents locked up in jail or would harm someone I love if I didn't send more. Eventually, I just decided, screw it. You have been building dirt on me, and it's not going to get easier. Eventually, this has to stop. So I told him I was done doing dirty things for him and blocked him on everything. Nothing more came of it. My belly dance video is down now. I've had therapy and really thought through it all now, but that was when I learned how dark and scary life can be. Getting a call at 3 a.m. from the corner to inform me that my mother had passed away. If that wasn't enough, I found out that she had unplugged her insulin pump and downed a bottle of Vicodin. A few weeks prior, she called me to ask if she could move in with me and my girlfriend. Being 20 and barely able to take care of myself, I told her no. Sometimes I still wonder if she would still be around if I would have just let her move in with us. No idea why the hell I'm sharing this after 16 years. Later in my life, considering I was super sheltered growing up, but I was longboarding to work at the time, 15, no car, and good exercise, when I got hit by a car while I was on the sidewalk. I was unconscious for two hours and came to in a pool of my own blood, with my left arm dangling due to a broken collarbone and humerus because my job was calling to see where I was. I was a kid, passed the F out in a pool of my own blood for two hours next to a busy road in my small town where everyone knew one another, and the lady whose yard I was flung into was just sitting there watching me. For how long? I don't know. But I called an ambulance and got whisked off to the hospital. When I called the ambulance, I was smack in the middle of two jurisdictions, so there were two called out. Of course, I could only go in one, but these paramedics were arguing with one another while I'm sitting in a daze covered in my own dried blood. I ended up getting two $3,000 ambulance bills that the insurance didn't cover and that my parents made me pay because they were in no way supportive of my hobby slash transportation. That was my entire college savings that I had made from working under the table since I was 12. My father was big on domestic violence. My earliest memory from like four is him punching through a bedroom door in a drunken rage. But it was when I was nine and he broke a beer bottle over her head because he thought she was fucking her brother, my uncle, if you guessed it was a drunken rage. 
I hit the panic button on the house alarm and he was screaming we were all going to die tonight when my 14 year old uncle, not the uncle my father thought my mother was having an affair with, and sister were crying in fear after running upstairs. I remembered watching my mother learn how to load up and use a shotgun. At 9 years old, I loaded a shotgun and pointed it at the back of my father's head from about 10 feet away. He was busy trying to stab my mother with a knife at this point, so he didn't see me. I remember in the chaos and screaming, then I felt a focused calm. I held my breath, finger on the trigger, and suddenly the police showed up. I dropped the gun, they tackled him, and my mother got taken away in an ambulance. My sister and uncle fell asleep from exhaustion, and I stayed up to clean up the blood all over the house, till the sheriff came to take us to temporary foster care. To my disbelief, I later found out I did everything right. That shotgun was ready to fire, just needed to pull the trigger. The greatest thing my mother did for me after this, besides getting us away, was sending me to a child therapist. This incident plus a dozen other reasons, and my father still doesn't understand why I want nothing to do with him. As a young teen, new to the internet, my friends and I were addicted to chat room roleplaying and did it for hours on end. I had a slew of characters that I created for specific themed RPS, some even including child characters that I had listed in my profile. It wasn't uncommon for folks to reach out and IM me whenever they needed someone to play a kid for whatever family RP they had, but all that changed one day in particular when I got a private message asking for a one-on-one -on -one family RP with a man and my toddler character. It started off all right. They went to the park, to the toy store, and just did all sorts of toddler appropriate things. But all of a sudden, it got all weird when he tried getting more romantic with it. He essentially started grooming my character right then and there and followed his pervy behavior with, whatever happens, just know daddy loves you very much. I immediately told him I was done, left and blocked him. At the time, the thought never crossed my mind that someone could be sexually attracted to a literal toddler. I've been aware of the many tragedies in the world since childhood, but one thing that I realized as a young adult was how many pedophiles there really are out there. I started looking back at my childhood and all the grown men that were sexualizing me and being completely inappropriate to me as well as witnessing my friends of the same age be treated so inappropriately. I've never been sexually molested, but the insinuation of it has occurred everywhere, at school, in my neighborhood, in sports and clubs, the adults at my friends' houses, family, friends, etc. I was never touched, but the nasty questions and comments that I got and what I think was special treatment at the time has happened countless times. I was never one-on-one -on -one in a room with any grown man for them to do anything with me, but I know based on their behavior around me that they would have if they had the chance. When you're a child, you don't understand how disgusting that behavior is until you grow up to realize how abnormal it really was and how many of them are out there. It's scary. Parents, please always keep an eye on your kids and everyone they're around. You truly never know. I lived in a dangerous area and had to go to a bus stop every day before and after school that was littered with druggies and thugs. For four years, I went there every day thinking that they're dangerous people, but they won't do anything to me. They just always seemed to be uninterested and would target someone else. Well, got attacked when I was in my junior year and got all of my shit stolen. My naivety straightened out real quick and believe you me, I've never been so vigilant about every place, thing, and person I encounter. I was 10 years old, living in a tiny town where nothing ever happens, and then my classmate's older sister got beheaded in her own home by her metalhead wannabe boyfriend. He then uploaded pictures of her unclothed, posed, headless body to the internet and killed himself. That was fucked, obviously, and I had nightmares for weeks. Then in secondary school, people kept digging up those pictures off and on and sending them around school because gore. I don't know why the family never moved, but they didn't. The classmate and I got closer as teenagers, and even though we never spoke about it, I believe some of her pretty serious issues not only stem from the huge trauma of losing her sister like that, but also from people treating it as a form of sick entertainment. When I was a kid, 10 to 11, kids around the block gathered around and started to kick me in the middle of the street because I was very thin and had very blonde hair. Talk about dumb reasons, huh? Worst thing is that my friends joined in instead of helping me because, you know, they wanted to fit in. And now, thanks to that, I don't trust people with good intentions because I'll never know what they will do when society pressures them to do something they don't want to do, only to fit in. I feel like everybody is playing some game 
that I am not a part of, to know. Lesson learned. People are mean and violent by nature. They will do anything to stay in their comfort zones, even hit a friend. Also, I think you never stop being innocent if that is in your nature. It's just that you give people less chances to hurt you. My mom and dad divorced at three, and my mom kept telling me why she divorced him, because he was abusive, looted his parents, and left them to die when their family home burnt to a crisp. Last year, just before COVID struck, my dad died. He overdosed on paracetamol accidentally, and I had no regrets. Mind you, I wasn't feeling happy either, but I wasn't all tears. He was a bad man after all. It was only after his death that I learned that he was actually a very good man and my mom's story was all a cook-up to alienate me against him. She'd tied him into marriage by blackmailing him, that she would slander his name if he as much dared to leave her. Eventually, my dad couldn't take it, signed the papers, and left. True to her word, my mom alienated me, my brother, and all his friends and peers against him. Eventually, the fact that he was treated like a psycho reached the breaking point, and he overdosed himself on paracetamol and killed himself really fucks me up that a man who was so good, who wanted to do nothing but good for the world, was treated so cruelly and backstabbed multiple times by the ones he trusted. He never got his due and had to die just so we could know the truth, hoping here that he's living a better life in heaven. I got addicted to pain pills when I was 19 and it escalated heroin pretty quickly. Had a 21-year-old stripper prostitute shoot up in my car while her one-year-old child was inside. I hate the stigma associated with addiction. I was lucky enough that I could go to a three to four week rehab. She didn't have that option. She couldn't take off work for a month. She didn't have anyone who could take care of her child for a month either. However, addiction will bring out the worst in people. One time I got a call from someone who owed me drugs. He said the guy he was with had overdosed and he needed help. I had just gotten my EMT license. I went to the rundown motel they were staying in and did what I could to help. I ended up telling him we needed to call an ambulance. I waited for the paramedics to take this guy away and then I told the guy to give me the drugs he owed me. I also used to buy drugs from a guy whose entire torso was tatted up and he had enough guns to arm a small army. There's other stuff that involves sexual violence, a lot of which involves children, but I'm careful about who I share that information with. In my experience, the world is always darker than you think it is. There are no limits to man's depravity. I grew up in suburbia, around straight-laced family that is opposed to guns, but I've stayed in places where I tucked a pistol in my waistband before I went out. If you gaze long enough into the abyss, the abyss will gaze back into you. Some of my lessons were learned late. I think I was 33 or 34 when I witnessed a coworker sabotage some of my equipment on camera get shown the replay in front of my spineless boss and him denied that it wasn't him. Like, dude, you're on camera. That's totally in the security footage. My boss just said, well, he says it's not him. Some people figure if they go all in with denial, it will become true. Some people just cave to social pressure. Of course, I have watched HR convince a woman that an incident where a supervisor placed his hand in her knee and tried to feel her up didn't happen. I watched a group of people cover up a friendly sexual harassing other women and his defense was mostly made up of women, turning on women, saying the harassment was made up, and I watched them completely tear apart one of their own rather than admit they were wrong. Recently, how people will cling to the ignorance and direct proof with COVID. I mean, I knew dumb people existed, but not 40% of the country. I've had discussions where it is evident that they will take what they feel is right over facts, science, and direct proof. It makes me wonder if you can have a shitty version of the Matrix where there's no mind-controlling machinery, but just people in denial. That's totally not a superior robot race controlling me, liberal plot. I never had many guy friends in elementary and middle school. I always hung out with the girls until I met this one guy who was in ninth grade while I was in eighth. We talked for about three weeks and quickly jumped into a relationship where everything was rushed and since I was never in a serious relationship, I just thought it was normal. Within 10 days of our relationship, he forced me to have sex with him, and no matter how many times I told him no, he still found ways to guilt trip me. He told me I didn't love him if I didn't have sex with him, and I didn't want to lose him. It carried on for seven months after that, until I got so sick of him and stopped caring about the relationship. The thing that messed me up so much is that I talked him out of suicide and constantly made him feel loved, 
and I got in return was trauma and mental pain. 